please welcome to the stage Dr. Brian Jacobs. Good afternoon. I'm a uh, program manager in the um, Microsystems Technology Office at DARPA, and I'm very excited to be here today in Pullman um, in order to moderate a panel discussion on will the future of computing be digital? Uh, this might give you some insight into some of the things that we think about um, back at MTO. Before I get started, I want to try to give you some context for what this question really means to me and what space we're going to be talking about. So most of you are probably familiar with what we mean by digital computing, some of the examples of which are shown on the, the left-hand side of this uh, slide, um, most notably things like your laptop. Uh, but a sort of a more formal way, we think of using Boolean operations that were mentioned earlier, like ANDs, in order to process information stored as ones and zeros in order to solve problems. Um, and these types of machines vary dramatically from your laptop uh, to large-scale supercomputing systems like uh, the Titan or uh, Summit machines at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab that are warehouse size supercomputers uh, to more special purpose or application-specific integrated circuits, the kinds of which are all around us in your smartphones and your smartwatches. So now, that's the uh, conventional or digital side. Uh, you might be uh, less familiar with some of the alternatives uh, depicted on the right-hand side. Uh, the, the top of the, uh, the right-hand side has two um, versions or flavors of things that you've probably heard a lot about as being the, the salvation for future computing, uh, which are quantum computers. These are, are typically uh, elevator-sized racks of equipment uh, that are very highly specialized uh, that we'll be talking a little bit about today. There are some more um, far out beyond that type of uh, uh, computing solutions shown by uh, uh, the, uh, the rotating um, DNA molecules and uh, other molecular forms of computing. Uh, and there are much more down to earth forms of alternative computing, which are, are some equivalent of analog computing, which are also growing in strength, uh, largely in the form of neuromorphic computing or spiking neural nets. Um, so the, the, the context of the question is not, is digital going to go away, but where are some of these alternatives really going to play going forward? So for example, if you have a problem to solve that takes too much time on your laptop, are you going to pay to have it solved on a supercomputer like Titan? or a quantum computer in the future. Likewise, if you're operating on the edge at, let's say, a, a small drone or something, and you can't afford the size, weight, and power footprint of a, a laptop, are you going to use a digital application-specific integrated circuit, or again, one of these um, alternative uh, technologies? Now, as you might imagine, uh, DARPA funds the whole spectrum of these kinds of problems. Um, and in fact, in MTO, we have um, programs both sides of the house. So one uh, example of an MTO program um, is one that's designed to make a digital accelerator for encrypted computing, so that someday you could envision being able to have data processed in the cloud where it never gets decrypted, eliminating a whole level of vulnerabilities. Um, likewise, one of the, the programs uh, that we're just getting started kind of fits in the middle, but we're, we're trying to leverage lessons learned from quantum computing uh, over the past few decades in order to take some of these physics-based approaches to solving problems and marry them up with uh, digital computers, uh, where the digital computers essentially stitch together solutions from these physical systems to solve bigger problems. Um, and that program is known as the uh, quantum-inspired classical computing program. Um, as you can imagine, uh, DARPA being DARPA, the goals of these programs is usually quite um, auspicious. So for example, trying to get an, an alternative computing um, uh, capacity, something that's the footprint of an elevator that can outperform a warehouse-sized supercomputer, or likewise, trying to reduce an elevator-sized rack of electronics down to a single chip. Um, one of the things that might be apparent as the panel discussion progresses today 
is that one of the interesting questions that seems trivial um, actually can have subtleties and helps guide what we do significantly at DARPA. And that is the simple question of how do we measure success? And it's actually very important that we get that right because otherwise we could misinterpret what the real impact of the, technolo the technology innovations are for the real applications that we're trying to impact. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and I'll introduce the uh, panelists for today, starting with uh, Dr. Jay Sun So, who's an associate professor in electrical engineering at, um, excuse me, Arizona State University. His research interests include efficient hardware design of machine learning and neuromorphic algorithms with integrated power management. Uh, he recently received a 2022 IEEE Transactions Best Paper Award for Ultra Energy Efficient In-Memory Compute Accelerators for Deep Neural Networks. The next panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Brad Lackey, who's a mathematician and computer science working as a quantum systems architect for Microsoft Quantum. Dr. Lackey has broad research interests in quantum algorithm development, quantum-inspired optimization, quantum error correction, and post-quantum cryptography. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Josh Fryman, who's a computer architect and fellow at Intel. His research in interests include developing novel microprocessor architectures, co-design of workloads and systems, disaggregated system architectures, novel memory architectures, photonic chip networks, and at scale system fabrics. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite uh, the audience uh, participating here and virtually to take advantage of the QR code and start to submit your questions um, as soon as they occur to you. Gentlemen, please. I'd like to start the, the panel discussion with a first question um, for Dr. So. Um, <coughs> Some of the things that you work on in the more analog domain seem to be more well uh, mature than some of the other technologies that we discussed. Could you please uh, tell us a little bit about the technology, why and where it outperforms digital, and what maybe some of the technical challenges to wider um, scale deployment of this technology are? Right. Um, so. As you know, you know, we talked about AI and you know, deep learning algorithms have exploded in recent years. And as such, um, custom hardware accelerators, um, a lot of them have been designed to efficiently execute them um, for both inference and training. Um, so a lot of the so-called systolic array kind of multiply and accumulate are the majority of the operations. So typically in all digital systems, you will have some memory banks. You will have a dedicated compute engine with, you know, um, to the array of these multiple accumulate um, processing engines. And then there will be a lot of data communication going back and forth, loading the data to do the compute. After the compute is done, you have to save that, save that data back to somewhere. So because of these, you know, actually the compute energy was not necessarily, when it was all benchmark at the system level, not necessarily always a dominating energy consumption factor. It was actually, you know, getting the data from, you know, this memory hierarchy and loading that and communicating that to this, you know, where the compute actually happens turns out to be one of the dominating factors in terms of energy. So to address that and to lower that, some of the so-called in-memory computing or compute in memory um, technologies and processing schemes have been proposed in both um, academia and industry in recent years. So in a nutshell, um, there, we're trying to bring compute to the memory because we don't necessarily want to always kind of row by row um, load data from the memory and always send it to somewhere distant. So we're trying to bring in compute, especially these uh, multiple and accumulate um, operations, which is, again, the dominant um, type of operations in deep neural, neural networks. So to do that, we basically try to, you know, break the conventional scheme of always accessing memory row by row, but instead we try to turn on multiple or even all rows of uh, memory subarray um, all together in the same cycle. And by doing that, we're trying to do some kind of analog computation along the bit line. For example, if, you know, depending on the bit, bitwise multiplication result, 
um, how many of them out of like the 256 rows turn on and they will bring down the bit line how fast um, depending on the time and total non occurrent we can kind of determine okay what was um, kind of the multiply and accumulate result in the analog domain in terms of the accumulated or weighted current or what the voltage is so typically there has been kind of transistor why just turn on and turn off um, how many of them out of the, all the rows so that will determine kind of the resistive way of accumulating the current and another approach um, some of these capacitor based um, charge sharing capacitive coupling we're trying some people um, researchers have been trying to implement this kind of Mac um, computation in terms of the analog voltage and then um, that analog voltage or current has to be digitized using some um, analog to digital converters, go back to, you know, communicate with the other parts of the digital system, for example. So by turning on all rows or multiple rows at the same time, this parallelism was greatly enhanced. Um, and we don't have to really, you know, load and communicate data from the memory to a separate compute engine. We are basically doing it all where the memory resides, um, especially like on-chip SRAM. Um, so that greatly reduced a lot of these kind of bottleneck in terms of data communication. So the energy efficiency um, wise for the same, you know, amount of Mac operations, I think that's where a lot of these attention and interest has uh, have grown that, okay, this type of analog mixed signal computing is at least for the Mac operations um, can bring up the energy efficiency um, quite a bit compared to some of these row by row memory based digital designs. Um, so I think that's where um, some of these um, attentions have been, but, you know, following up your question, what are kind of the challenges of that? So as I mentioned, these have to be digitized um, and analog to digital converters, as you know, are always kind of a tricky part, area and energy hungry um, circuit designs, although there has been a lot of advancement. So um, typically for complex problems, we need a higher resolution ADC. So at the end, although we saved a lot of energy and area with the analog circuits along the bit line, the ADC might become the dominant part uh, in terms of the total area and energy um, of these uh, computed memory macros and system based on that. So I think those kind of um, ADCs and if there's, I mean, analog, again, um, there's trade-off of signal to noise ratio is inherently at least somewhat um, deteriorated compared to a very high noise margin digital design. So how much that will affect the accuracy of your target deep learning algorithm um, has been some of the challenge that has to be considered too. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question that I have is for uh, Dr. Lackey. Um, Brad, given all of the considerable hype that is associated with quantum over the past um, few years, maybe decade, um, can you sort of set our expectations for uh, how it could possibly live up to, <laughs> to what we've been told? Well, decade is even being nice, uh, a couple decades. Um, well, by popular media, obviously, quantum computers can solve every problem, right? So, uh, so right at the outset, um, you know, quantum computers are, are special purpose devices. They're designed to use quantum effects to solve certain computational problems. Um, you know, certainly in Shor's algorithm back in the uh, mid-90s, uh, sort of set the stage for um, solving problems that people didn't think could be solved. And from there, the, uh, the picture changed quite a bit. Um, oddly, uh, I opened up my browser this morning. I actually can't remember what I was looking for because on the news feed that popped up there, there was uh, exactly this, quantum computers solve everything type article. Normally, I don't click on those things, but I made the mistake of doing so this morning. Um, and that was a relatively painful read. Um, but just uh, as a case in point down there, you know, one of the, one of the explanations why quantum computers are going to be so great is because they are blindingly fast and will compute everything much more quickly than classical computers, which is... Um, well, is exactly the opposite of what's true. Uh, quantum computers are actually very, very slow. Quantum systems are very, very fragile. If we try to uh, drive them very quickly, as we would with a classical computer, of course, we destroy those wonderful quantum effects, which allow the speed ups of our algorithms. And so uh, are quantum computers ever going to live up to that kind of hype? Well, no, because simply they can't. That's not, simply not possible. Uh, why do we believe quantum computers are going to solve problems uh, at scale very quickly? Well, it's because of the quantum algorithms. Uh, we have algorithms where we exploit quantum effects 
um, that simply can't be realized uh, through classical computations alone. Um, and so when you uh, read some of these articles, there is a kernel of truth hiding in all of these, uh, these hyped up statements. Although they're not fast, they do allow for algorithms which are, uh, un they're, not, they're very novel, they're very different than what we understand, and that's where the speed is gonna come from. And so when we look into those, uh, where do we see benefits? Well, I mean, I can't predict the future. Who knows where the, where the industry is gonna go eventually? But in the near term, we can look at some things. We can look at, for instance, uh, emulating uh, quantum systems. And so one could imagine a quantum computer as a physics lab in a box. Uh, instead of going to the lab and finding these materials or special devices which will realize a quantum effect, you can program that quantum effect onto a quantum computer and simulate that quantum system. The ramifications in chemistry and materials are relatively clear through Hamiltonian simulation. There's been a lot of work on that recently. Um, and so, uh, so in terms of living up to its hype, well, the, the people who dig into these quantum systems, quantum chemists and the like, they understand what's at, what's at stake here. And so, uh, so quantum computers are already living up to the hype there, even though we can't do them yet. Uh, there's no doubt that the, the ramifications of this are going to be big. Thank you. Um, Josh, uh, your experience in developing multiple different uh, digital architectures, trying to integrate in all of the latest and greatest uh, technologies, surely uh, you've picked up a, a laundry list of maybe assumptions that, that people typically developing some of the alternatives might not appreciate. Um, would you care to elaborate on that? Sure, uh, I'll poke my colleagues here with a sharp stick for a moment. Uh, <laughs> these are very cute technologies. Uh, broad scale application is very challenging. Let's take a step back to where you started, Brian. <clears throat> you think about a computer as your phone, your laptop, something to interact with. It's got a graphical interface. You know how to ask it to do things. Stuff magically happens. The pace of innovation today is unlike any time in the history of computing. It's at the pace of algorithms and software at the cloud. People don't write in C code. You graduate from the university, even in graduate school, you've never touched a line of C code in your life. If I ask you to do assembly, it's just a lost cause. People want to write in Python, Julia, Jupyter Notebooks. They want it all to magically work under the hood. So it's great to have an optimized technology. I can improve this device. I can get 10x more energy efficiency. I can do this, I can do that. But if it doesn't seamlessly plug into their existing high-level code without them changing anything, it's never going to get used. So now you have this fundamental challenge. Let's go back to compute and processing and memory. I love this topic. I've studied this a decade ago. We spent four or five years really hammering on it. But the way they're looking at doing it today, whether it's the Samsung PIM HBM or some of the more analog PDF kind of compute, is exactly the noise margin problem. So you have two issues. One is I have, generally I'm doing 8-bit or 16-bit arithmetic. I do a mathematical operation. I accumulate it out in an 8 or 16-bit result. And I want to apply this to AI. But AI, you don't go bit slice arithmetic down you expand the result. And as soon as you have to expand the result, you have a new problem. Because I like having an operating system, I like having security, I like having all these things in the cloud, so I need to now have my memory device not be passive and dumb, but be smart and understand where it sits in a global address space, initiate its own transactions to peer memory devices because it doesn't know how the data structure is laid out. Virtualization has taken these huge matrices, vectors, sparse graph information distributed across all kinds of memory controllers, all kinds of physical memories. You can't do bit slice arithmetic and expand the result to maintain the accuracy and converge the, the precision of the result if you can't see and then access adjacent memories and understand these structures and translations. So the second thing is things like quantum. I love this approach. I love anything like neuromorphic. PDF, right? anything that's going to get me more efficiency that I can bring into my system because digital is here forever. People want that high level digital control plane. And by the way, digital today is actually analog. We just pretend to call it digital because it's so fast and design margins are so tight, you can't do anything else. So you have a digital control plane that never goes away. And now you bring me new technologies. Let's imagine in this future, 10 years from now, not only do we have working quantum computers, they're room temperature. So I have digital, I have quantum, I have neuromorphic, Throw in an FPGA, throw in a GPU, tensor core kind of thing, throw in a bunch of memory, stack it all up, package it all together, bolt it down, and now I have one fundamental question. How am I measuring the success of this platform? What was my cost of doing that? How do I move my data around? What is my energy cost? 
When we talk to customers and customers talk to us, the number one metric at the end of the day is TCO, total cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. If your metrics are on the device level and you've made a great breakthrough, fantastic, come talk to me. But if I can't take your device and plug it into the software stack seamlessly and show an end result that improves the TCO, you have created a dodo. So. Just would uh, would either of you like to respond to uh, <laughs> some of those? Uh... No, absolutely. Um, cost of operations is an absolutely critical measure. And so, uh, so we, we regularly talk about this, as, uh, particularly in this uh, new concept of quantum advantage. Uh, there's a lot of push of building, um, building a quantum machine that can do something that can't be done classically. Okay. And, uh, and that's good and fine, but doing something useful that can't be done classically is really the, really the question at heart, is, is can we do something where the cost of the machine that does it is actually less than the value of the computation that's done. Absolutely. And, uh, and well, still a long way from that, but that's, uh, that's the ultimate goal. I agree entirely. Yeah. Um, Jason, I have a, a, a question with regard to um, uh, neural networks. So neural networks, uh, at least the, the digital versions, are inspired by what goes on in nature, which I don't think of as digital at all, but more analog, um, even though we have these uh, notions of spiking. Um, is it reasonable to assume that we will have specialized all analog neural networks in the future? Um, and if, if not, what, what would be the technical challenges that would be uh, stopping that? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I mean, there have been a few works that try to do kind of all analog neural network, and their motivation is exactly kind of, you know, every layer or every kind of bulk of computation, if you have to, you know, do analog, which was efficient per se, um, let alone going all the way to the software stack. Let's just, you know, focus on this for now because this is challenging enough. But I mean, look, analog computation itself was efficient, but you have to go back to you know digital by going through an ADC, then do you know do like a digital to analog conversion again to do the efficient analog. I mean, so these loops of ADC and DAC, you know, have to go back and forth. It's just you know too much you know area and energy hungry. So can we just get rid of that? Don't go to digital and just stay in analog. Might be more efficient. No ADC and DAC. Um, kind of overhead. So I think that motivation is good. And to do that, you need to, I mean, you need both like uh, analog compute mechanism um, with some circuits or devices. And also you need some analog memory. Um, you cannot, you know, rely on um, just digital memory, for example. But still, I think it all goes back to kind of the noise margin problem that uh, inherently, you're more susceptible to noise, variability, process variation. So I think that's one of the main reasons why it hasn't really become a mainstream. Mm -hmm. Have to benchmark and evaluate accuracies for the same benchmark, especially for the complex ones. And then there's always going to be some degradation of accuracy, whether that's small or relatively small or large. So I think, you know, always have to set the accuracy target, for example, or whatever we can, um, we can manage to um, sacrifice a little bit. I mean, at least set that to be the same and then compare both the digital and analog kind of um, apple to apple as, as mm -hmm. much as possible. But I think the noise margin, if any, some of these conversion um, and interface um, kind of overheads has been preventing, per se, analog, or especially all analog approaches to become the mainstream. But to, to add on that, I think where analog computing at least could make more sense, in my opinion, is you know, where everything is currently digital and you know, it works fine, you know, try to introduce analog in the middle of it, then you have to somewhere go from digital to analog and analog to digital. So I think what could make sense for analog computing is there are some you know, natural signals that are inherently in analog, not necessarily our brain, but let's say you know, our audio signals, some of the image sensors are analog, you know, and there's you know, ADCs in there, analog computation is going on. So if the input, primary input signal is analog there and we have to digitize it to you know, follow that up with some ensuing processors or accelerators, then doing you know, analog computation or some kind of smart functionality in the sensor end um, could make sense. I think there's still 
a lot to think about there, but I think that's might be, I mean, dealing with, you know, already analog signals there and trying to do compute there before going back to digital, if that helps from the system level could make sense, but I think if you're already establishing digital and then try to go back to analog, going back and forth, I think that's one of the main challenges. Okay, so maybe one of my takeaways from what I think you just said was that uh, maybe engineering has to catch up with nature a little bit before we get to <laughs> larger scale analog sure. processors. Yeah, sure. Um, before I get to the, the first audience uh, question, um, I'd like to ask Brad to maybe give us a little bit of context because when we talk about quantum computing, that actually doesn't mean anything because there are multiple flavors of quantum Indeed. computing. Could you talk a little bit or introduce the notion of energy-based uh, quantum computing or quantum annealing? The quantum annealing, yes. Um, well, so we talk about quantum computing, but of course, quantum technologies is a much broader family of, of entities. Uh, you know, we're, we're not here to talk about quantum communication and quantum sensing. Those are other major topics in the field. But within quantum computing um, itself, and this is actually related to the first question, as we'll get to very shortly, um, there's a notion of, of quantum annealing. Um, as an algorithm, this dates to about 2000 by the group out of MIT um, who posed adiabatic quantum optimization as a computational effect for, for solving optimization problems using quantum, quantum methods. Uh, the adiabatic uh, theorem uh, is, a, is a relatively technical theorem, but as far as an algorithm uh, goes, the, the principle is to prepare uh, an initial quantum state, which is easy to prepare, and evolve that into a quantum state which solves some computational problem. Um, and then rely on the adiabatic theorem to state that as long as the evolution is slow enough, um, in fact, the, the quantum system will stay in its ground state and, and resolve that problem. Um, this is a statement at zero temperature, as they like to say it. Uh, if you have a non-zero temperature, which is the world we live in, um, then there will be thermal effects involved with that, and we often use the term quantum annealing uh, for such systems. Um, they're very, very different than what we think of as, as normally uh, computing. We wouldn't program such a thing in Python or in a Jupyter notebook, but what it might look like is, um, is a SQL database query is I describe the features of the problem that I want solved, and I pass it to the annealer, which then returns a quantum state with those features, and that solves the problem. Um, the, the don't rely, quantum annealers uh, rely on a property called quantum tunneling, as opposed to uh, the things you'll f normally find in so-called gate model quantum computing, such as entanglement and superpositions. Um, but uh, and it's a very attractive programming model, and, um, and quantum annealing devices uh, are more easily controlled. Uh, their error correction is a little bit easier to work with than, uh, than gate model quantum computing, and hence they've been built to uh, much larger scales today than the gate model machines. Um, so, you know, if you go yeah, ahead and pick I, up the yeah, next question, I go to that question, exactly I think, it, yes. would, it be, would it be safe to say, though, that as, as interesting as the, uh, the quantum annealing type uh, solutions are, or technologies are, there's no, there's no proof of right. a guaranteed speed up over classical techniques? That's right. Um, well, proofs are hard to come by in any circumstance, <laughs> right? So, uh, so I, I guess I mentioned Hamiltonian simulation earlier and Shor's algorithm earlier. Many of you have probably heard of Grover's algorithm, uh, but if I asked you to name a fourth quantum algorithm, um, that might be a little bit of a challenge. And, uh, and the reason is it's very difficult to make novel quantum algorithms. Many people have tried for many years, and, uh, and it's not uncommon that we, uh, we so-called dequantize them. It's happened in the, a little bit of a cold war between machine learning and quantum computing for a while now, is uh, things get dequantized into classical algorithms that are then based on the effect of the quantum algorithm, but can be emulated efficiently on a classical machine. And that's really the, the principle behind quantum-inspired classical, uh, quantum-inspired optimization, typically. There are other things in quantum-inspired uh, classical computation, is to, uh, to dequantize that quantum tunneling effect and write down a classical algorithm that has the same properties, so the same sorts of speed-ups. Um, that you would see in a, in a quantum adiabatic machine. Yep, so Brad is kind of uh, teasing out the, the first uh, audience participation question, which is quantum-inspired classical computing sounds interesting. Can you tell us more? Um, so hopefully everybody got one of these DARPA pamphlets. Um, and somewhere in the middle, there's actually a little uh, brochure piece on this quantum-inspired classical computing program that we're starting. Um, and since I'm the program manager for that, I'd like to take the moderator prerogative <laughs> to uh, answer that question. That was not planned by me in any way, shape, or form. Um, so uh, uh, quantum-inspired uh, classical computing uh, tries to leverage the lessons that we learn from um, adiabatic quantum computing 
where when we started benchmarking it, looking at for a speed up, uh, we started developing algorithms that were actually uh, simulations of the quantum systems that ran on classical computers that were now becoming the best algorithms for solving certain optimization problems. So the main question of um, quantum-inspired uh, classical computing is, can we make hardware that's specifically geared so that we don't have to simulate physical systems? So we're looking at interacting dynamical systems that naturally settle into low energy states that solve optimization problems. Okay, so uh, next audience question. Without any hype or speculation in the response, this should be good, <laughs> what specific real problem outside encryption can be solved with a quantum sensor or computer that cannot be solved with conventional computers? How and why? Uh, I'm not saving you on this one. No, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, no hyper speculation. Okay, lovely. Um, well, so I mentioned Hamiltonian simulation earlier as, as an algorithm. This goes all the way back to, to Feynman's original uh, proposition of using uh, quantum mechanics as a, a method for computation. Um, as a computer, it is quantum by its very nature. And so letting it run, you are seeing the evolution of a quantum system. Um, and so we know, uh, and this has been proven, that there are exponential speedups to be seen in, the, uh, in simulating the evolution of quantum systems. Okay, so, uh, so where we are now in terms of um, not being able to solve a problem that can be solved classically, I presume that means uh, one that we're not willing to pay for classically, but of course, you know, if we're willing to let things run for millions of years, they, they can be solved. Uh, and so simulating the um, catalysis, that's a, that's a good one. Um, in, a, in a chemical reaction involving catalysis, you have a large active free space of electrons. Um, simulating that on a classical computer becomes intractable very, very quickly because of the quantum dynamics that's inherent in that. Uh, quantum computer um, can emulate those because that's what it does, just very, very naturally. And so, uh, so there's, uh, there's one example that we know will have real-world applications, probably um, not too far off, and you know, no hype, no speculation, so I'm not going to give a concrete number on that. But, uh, but it's not like, you know, over the horizon. So uh, I'd like to add maybe one additional wrinkle of that, because there was sort of a, a seed planet in that question, at least to me, that came up with sensors. Um, and so... Uh, it seems very realistic to me that if you have an inherently quantum sensor, um, which, which could be optical or, or, or magnetic or, or otherwise, that maybe if you're trying to discriminate something, the way to reach the ultimate physics limited um, accuracy of that system would be with a quantum processor mm -hmm. so that you're not simply sampling the quantum. So very much like the analog case where don't go, from, don't go from analog to digital and solve the problem digital. Don't go from quantum to classical and solve the problem classical. So I think there's some other use cases that might be of interest there. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next audience question. Can you elaborate <clears throat> on why quantum might not live up to the hype? What are we doing <laughs> wrong or what are we missing? So um, if anybody else besides Brad, <laughs> Or, or I would be happy to answer it in, in tandem with Brad. Yeah, well, I mean, feel free to, to inject now if you'd like. Of course, I can... I can. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you see if something that I say here is wrong? Because uh, from, <laughs> from my perspective, uh, I, I've been involved in benchmarking quantum algorithms, and a lot of the hype um, surrounds this notion that they, the scaling is better than classical, so that there is eventually a break-even point where you will definitely outperform classical for some of these algorithms that uh, Brad talked about. And while that's true, there's a heavy cost to pay for operating in quantum, even if we're not talking about the overhead of quantum error correction. Uh, just the, uh, the way that you have to do uh, reversible logic operations in order to get these algorithms to maintain quantum uh, increases that overhead. So we studied many of these algorithms over a decade ago. And what we do is we, kept, we, we sort of phrase it in terms of what is the break-even point where the quantum computer would be the one that we would go to? What size problem is that? And in a lot of these things that you see in the literature, the answer is, well, you need a, a certain number of nuclear power plants, and it might take a year or 10 years or 100 years in order for that break-even point where, where a quantum actually wins for a lot of these algorithms. So I think that's what one of the things that a lot of folks miss is this notion of 
Asymptotics are great, that's what the theories give us, but that doesn't tell us what the overhead is and where that break-even point is. Indeed. The, the, oh, please. I do want to jump on that for just a second, Brian. I'm nothing controversial this time. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say that there's an implicit assumption in that question, if it's not obvious, that classical computing is sitting still, and it is not. And at least my team, my group, other groups I work with at Intel, we are spending a huge amount of effort to make scaling. Network connections, bandwidth, latencies, energies, phenomenally better, orders of magnitude. And what you have is a moving target. So I don't disagree with anything you said, mm -hmm. but I just want people to really stop and think that this is not a static equilibrium, right? It's a moving target all the way down. I'm glad you brought that up because one of the reasons um, that, or one of the ways that I talk about the quantum inspired uh, classical computing program is to actually put quantum out of business for whole classes of problem <laughs> by moving that break even point um, uh, to the point where they just can't compete. Okay, uh, next audience question. How do you plan to map the logical qubits to a feasible number of physical qubits, and how many are needed to keep errors under control? A little bit technical. Uh. It is a little bit technical. Yep. Uh, maybe just in a general sense. Um, I mean, I, I, it's been a while since I looked at this, but I know at least one of the good surface codes, it's at least a thousand to one kind of ratio for error correction. A th thousand to one is not a, not a bad ballpark for, um, for physical qubit fidelities around three to four nines uh, fidelity in our systems. Um, so the, there is a plan. Um, it's not easy, uh, but uh, given any characteristics of a, a physical qubit, we can, in principle, explain what the logical fidelity would be of uh, qubits encoded in various types of quantum codes. Brian mentioned the surface code, which is by far the, the most popular one. There are other families of them, color codes, or most recently uh, Floquet codes have become uh, very popular. It's, um, it's a well-studied subject. There's probably 100, 200 papers coming out a month on the subject. Um, very hard to keep up with, in fact. And so it's, it's been well-researched um, you know, as part of a, any good uh, quantum computing stack. Uh, this estimate of the underlying quantum resources that are required to run, run a quantum algorithm, they're being computed. Um, and so rather than targeting a, a quantum system on the back end, one can target a resource estimator and get a feel for what the overhead for quantum error correction. Um, if you want, it's a technical question, so I'll add a, add a little technical point. In particular, the generation of, uh, of magic states is, uh, is actually going to dominate uh, a lot of the algorithms. Um, and that computation can be done effectively and gives us some, uh, some eye-watering numbers of how, big the, how big the overheads are going to be. But yeah, one of the uh, one of my uh, old jokes uh, about quantum was because of the overhead associated with quantum error correction, I used to think a quantum computer is going to spend 99.99% of its time doing error correction. Yep, yep. Um, and then when I heard about um, adiabatic approaches to doing gate-based uh, quantum error correction, where adiabatic means you slow down the interactions so that you don't introduce errors, I then r realized, well, that form of uh, computing the computer uh, will 99.99999% uh, of the time be doing absolutely nothing, essentially. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, next question. How promising is uh, classical quantum hybrid computing and is DARPA supporting it? Um, so as the only DARPA representative on the stage, um, I'll try to answer that. Um, actually, uh, I, I think I tried to phrase properly that the quantum-inspired classical computing program um, is hybrid in some sense um, in terms of using the lessons learned from quantum. Um, maybe the closest other program at DARPA that is um, more on this hybrid quantum boundary is where uh, we're trying to use noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, devices in order to solve optimization problems. So it's actually kind of interesting. It's the same application space that the quantum-inspired classical computing program goes after, uh, but it is using this mix of these, uh, the, the, the best kinds of, uh, of quantum bits that we have today in order to solve these optimization problems. This sounds like a great question for uh, Josh. What exactly do you mean by a full stack ecosystem? <laughs> it is a great question. Um, and I do think that my colleagues should spend a moment answering it as well. But uh, let me talk about it from the perspective of the people that I interact with, uh, both you know, customers and ingredient suppliers and so on. But at the end of the day, it comes back to what I was describing. People want an operating system. They want reliability. They want their data available. They want to be networked. 
They want to have security. <coughs> security. Um, we should talk about security. It's a feel-good metric. There is no metric. You cannot possibly measure it. It's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, <laughs> but that aside, uh, they want this perception of an easy-to-use environment, and they want it all to just work. They want to have to think about it. Where is my data in the cloud? Where is my data on storage? Is it encrypted? Is it not encrypted? They just want it to work. So the full stack ecosystem is that that's the end user experience. Writing on top of the cloud, writing on top of Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever your favorite flavor is, they want that experience. And if your magic technology does not plug into that completely transparently and seamlessly, you have not addressed the full stack ecosystem but now it gets even more complicated. And there's a whole story about Best Buy and Geek Squad I'll skip for the sake of time. Uh, but at the end of the day, not only does it have to plug in, but the era of people building specialized systems and running in their lab mm -hmm. or running in a mission deployed scenario is over. Right? It's just not gonna happen. It has to plug into the cloud from get-go, which means those security features virtualization, cloud integration, lockdown, BIOS control, root of trust, all these other things come into play. So it's not just enough, right, to say, oh, I can plug into this. You also plug into the cloud from day one, even for a test demo for DARPA, because they no longer have the people in-house who can deal with low-level access. And that's my interpretation. If you feel like your domains have, have a different <coughs> stack, I'd love to hear it. No, I mean, I. I, I don't think academia research goes all the way to building a full stack ecosystem. We just don't have too much manpower. So we would have to, you know, collaborate with industry or collaborate with other people working on different stacks of the system. But yeah, I agree with what you said. Yeah, absolutely. The software stack is the software stack. We have plenty of technologies that can plug into that. But ultimately, when it reaches the user, it has to be in a human readable form, There's classical form. This, this thing called Azure, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I've heard of it. So uh, Brad, as a, as a re recovering crypto math guy, did mm. you want to comment on Josh's well, about uh, security measures? <laughs> mm, probably not in public. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a really quick example. I have, I have beaten my head against this wall, and this will be quick. Uh, with some of the top security experts out there. And I've just asked one question because they became incredibly frustrated with the program I was trying to move the needle on. And they said, there's no way to measure one if this is successful. And I said, okay, let's back up. How do you measure the corporate network security hardness? On a scale of one to 100, is it measured in S bits, right? What is the metric and how do you measure it? And they came back and said, doesn't exist. There is no metric. Your firewall, your antivirus stuff, it's just a statement that what we know is going to work as a compromise won't attack that system. It gives you no guarantees about tomorrow. We don't even pretend that it does. It's a feel-good insurance policy. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have time for uh, one more question. I'm going to try to answer this quickly because this is actually something that's very near and dear to my heart. Up, oh, can you back up from that last question? Um, uh, about the physical nature of what's used for qubit implementations, that seems to impact the feasibility. And haven't there been recent research results on more reliable qubits with longer coherence time? It's a technical question. Um, but here's my non-technical answer. One of the problems in quantum is that we're measuring success from the wrong direction. We need to go to Alpha Centauri, and we're measuring how high our right brother's plane can fly off the ground. That's the nature of the gap. We haven't significantly decreased it. So greater coherence time is great. Um, but until we actually cr across a, a specific threshold, uh, we still have all these uh, scalability issues um, to contend with. So I think that's about uh, time, it for the time that we have to, to answer questions. Uh, before I, I thank the panel, um, I just wanted to make a comment on um, how we fulfill DARPA's mission in order to um, uh, create and prevent technical surprise. Uh, for me, one of the critical aspects of that is to use uh, science and engineering principles in order to help guide creativity in order to create tomorrow. Um, and so that's what I see a program manager is doing. Um, and I would uh, highly uh, request that people who have uh, big audacious ideas for creating future technologies or ideas about how we can use 
current technologies better, more effectively in uh, oddball ways in order to solve problems, please uh, come and talk to one of the uh, DARPA representatives here at DARPA Forward. Um, thank you again for uh, participating, and I'd like to, to thank the panel again uh, for their time and interest in this uh, activity. Well, thank you, for the thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.